Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. It's that time of week again where my business partner, Sam Russ, takes over the show and interviews our guests. I hope you enjoy the show. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Sam Rust. I'm joined today by George Cruz. Uh, George is an experienced commercial bridge lender. He's closed well over a billion dollars in loans nationwide over a, a 20 plus year career. Uh, in addition to just lending, George has worked as a value add multifamily broker and has studied the syndication model for multifamily businesses. So really brings a, a unique blend of experiences to the show today. George, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So George, you and I were chatting a little bit before we went online, but really we want to talk about bridge lending. Um, and you've been to many different events around the country and bridge lending often has a, a less than stellar reputation, which in my experience, I've actually done a few bridge loans. I think that's a little bit unfair. Um, but I'm curious if you could elaborate, you know, why or where bridge lending fits into the overlay kaleidoscope of all the lending options that are out there. Um, and maybe what are some of the, the misnomers that that product has received over the years? Sure. Well, bridge lending, and, you know, um, thank you for the introduction. Bridge lending is just one arrow in a quiver people can be looking at. And as we discussed before we came on, a lot of people just want to look at the interest rate. You get your credit card you know, offer in the mail, you get your mortgage from your house. Everyone looks at interest rate first. But when you get to commercial, there's a lot more components to it. it it's not just interest rate because at the end of the day, all of your listeners and, and everybody are investors at the end of the day. They're looking for a yield that you know makes sense to themselves, makes sense to their investors, and makes sense to put out that capital from an opportunity cost standpoint. So just looking at interest rate, you know, is occasionally short-sighted. And right now there are a lot of lenders out there. There's a lot of capital out there. Uh, people can get aggressive on bank loans and, and CMBS and agency debt and, and life companies. And there are a lot of instances where that just makes sense, especially in multifamily. It's a favorite asset class that has been for, for years and years and it'll continue to be uh, for years to come. But there are scenarios where a bridge loan just makes sense. Uh, as we discussed, you know, there are people that just can't or, or won't qualify for, for recourse that a bank may require. You may just want higher leverage. And we could talk about that and why the higher leverage actually makes sense. If you start looking at the residual, you know, yield differential between a, a bank loan and a potential stretch bridge loan, there's you know tertiary markets. There's, there's value ad plays that a lot of your listeners focus on. When I've been out to the, syndication conferences, it, there's a big talk about adding rubs and increasing rents and, and adding some CapEx and, and putting, you know, additional fees on and a focus on expenses that, you know, can create significant value in a short period of time. And you need a flexible lender to help you get in and a flexible lender to help you get out and focus on that interest rate, focus on the, you know, the bank financing, the agency financing, once you've enacted your business plan, because that's when you've created your value. That's when you want the long-term low interest. What you want up front, if you're doing a bigger business plan on a syndication, is flexibility and a lender to work with. And so, you know, we've talked about different scenarios, value add, tertiary markets, value add. We had a heavy value add deal um, that had a bunch of foundation work and sewer work. And we opted to go with a bridge loan in that circumstance. And it worked out really well. One of the things that I hear, complaints that I've heard anecdotally about bridge lenders is not all bridge lenders are created equal. Um, and some folks maybe are more on the, the swim with the sharks, so to speak. They're debt funds that are maybe looking to acquire projects instead of act as a partner. Why does the industry have that reputation? Um, or you know, what, what brings to that? And what sets apart arena investors, um, the group that you work for? Sure. Well, br bridge lending, much like saying affordable housing, Bridge lending is a very broad topic. It's a, it's a catch-all for, for a large group of lenders. And yes, some of them are more of your loan-to-own, hard-money type lenders. They're, they're going to be higher rate. They're going to say they're only focused on 
the, the collateral at the end of the day, because at the end of the day, they don't mind taking back that collateral. There, there is a component of that, and they fall into this larger umbrella. You also have a very large component right now of people calling themselves bridge lenders that are really bank light. They're traditionally bankers or, or they're backed by life companies, but what they're looking for on a bridge standpoint is a little bit more yield than they can get in the, the regular market. So they're going to look at the 90% occupied because someone's taking it to 95. They're going to look at the very light rehab. They're still going to look at a top 50 MSA. They're going to call themselves bridge lenders. The, the middle ground here, which is where we play at Arena, where I've always played my entire career, is your traditional bridge. We, we have no interest in owning this property. It's, it's not our skill set. It's not our expertise. If we unfortunately had to take one back, we would get rid of it immediately. What we're trying to do is work with lenders or and work with borrowers to enact their business plan. And that's where we come in. That's what makes uh, Arena so special is we've created this platform under a two and a half billion dollar hedge fund. So we've got the risk tolerance to look at business plans, but every member of our team has done a billion dollars plus worth of business. I personally ran a private equity company for eight years, focused solely on commercial real estate nationwide and to some extent worldwide. So we've, we've seen deals, we've seen deals succeed, we've seen deals fail. And that's the kind of structure you need if you're enacting a bigger business plan. Somebody who can look to the future isn't just going to underwrite a, a T12, but is going to be able to look at what, the, what does it look like in 24 months, 36 months? Can we get comfortable that you're going to be able to increase rents the way you say they're going to be able to based on putting $7,500 a unit in the CapEx? That, that's, your, that's your down the fairway bridge lender. We'll, we'll, we'll look at things quickly and efficiently. We'll close quicker than, than an agency will because we can get our arms around it quicker. But at the end of the day, we're a lender, not an REO property owner. That's, that's not our intention. And, and it's not the intention of most bridge lenders. I just think we get lumped in with the, the hard money side of things because there's only so many buckets you can put lenders. And so the hard money people got lumped in with us. Yeah. There's a lot of first time syndicators or folks who are newer to real estate that listen to this show. Um, and there's, could you speak to any common mistakes or maybe the items that are left out in an application process that people would be wise to pay attention to? What, what exact factors are you looking at when you first see a deal? Obviously, underwriting rent growth and the story behind a deal is a big component of that. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I think most people are pretty good at getting information out. The, the, the few things you just have to be aware of is you want to put together, a, a, if you're going to ask me or my team to, to underwrite to a pro forma, and to a business plan. Make sure it's an accurate pro forma business plan. That, that's the first thing. And, and the most glaring thing I see more than anything else is on the real estate tax side. Real estate taxes, when you buy a property that has an assessed value of $2 million and you're buying it for $10 million, real t- tax, taxes are gonna go up. <laughs> they're gonna go up this year because they're assessed based on January 1st, but they're gonna go up next year. And that could go up pretty substantially. So you really need to make sure your pro forma makes logical sense. Don't, don't come to me and say you're increasing rents 50% with no capex. Uh, the, the person who owned it previously to you, it wasn't an idiot. They, they may have been lax in increasing their rents, but 99% of the time, you know, they knew what they were doing to some extent. So, you know, make sure things are rational. If they're even remotely rational, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you on it because I know how to underwrite the deal. I'll scrub it myself. Any good bridge lender will scrub it themselves and be able to come back to you with a sizing and a value expectation based on our analysis. But my analysis is going to start first and foremost with the anchoring of your pro forma. And if I don't trust the pro forma, it's almost a non-starter. There's a lot of folks that, you know, have been taken advantage of the low interest rate climate that we've been in for the last five years or so. Um, you know, bragging about, hey, I got sub 3% interest rate on this long-term fixed debt. And, you know, there's definitely scenarios where that works. There's a reason the agencies originate as much as they do. Um, but one of your mantras is looking at investor yield or overall deal yield, not just at the interest rate. Could you expound on that a little bit for our audience? Sure. Uh, interest rate is the sexy thing. It's when, when someone says they get a loan, the first thing they're asked is, what are you paying for it? Like, what's your, what's your rate? And that's what you go to the country club. That's what you go to the, the syndication conferences and you tell people you got sub 3%. And that's all well and good. But 
there are other metrics that need to be looked at. You, you've got your equity multiple, you've got your cash on cash returns, you've got your, you know, your IRR. And I get a lot of syndication packages, not just from a lender standpoint, but I subscribe to a lot of probably your clients' email lists just because I've met them all at these conferences. And I consistently see people going out and advertising that they're raising funds and doing an equity raise with a 15% plus IRR, 17% plus, 20% plus IRR. Well, they're using IRR as a metric, but you know, what, let's remember what that means. Let's say you hit your business plan. Well, what that essentially means is you're paying 20 cents on the dollar for your equity if you're hitting a 20% IRR for your clients. So yeah, you may be getting 3% from a bank, but it may be at 65% leverage because you need it to be non-recourse because as the syndicator, you're only holding 10% of the equity and you don't want to bring someone in that covers the net worth of liquidity or you just don't want to sign on the, the paper and I don't blame you. You know, my wife would kill me if I ever tried to sign over full recourse on like a $10 million loan. But, you know, the reality is, let's say you're proposing, just quick, quick numbers, let's say you're proposing 65% bank debt, and then you're going to go out and tell your investors you're getting 20% IRRs. Well, if I can get you 85% leverage on a bridge, but I'm at 6%, that's double the bank rate, not as sexy to tell your friends. My residual additional capital from the, from the 65 to the 85 is costing you about 16% which is lower than the 20% you're paying the equity, but I'm picking up the difference in that equity because you're going to have to cover that cost somehow. So, you know, you're getting your, your money actually cheaper than the equity. You also have the opportunity to give away less of the upside because you're raising less LP money, you know, whether it's passive or active, you know, sponsor and equity money. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits to using a bridge because here's, here's where it is. And, and I apologize for kind of tan, going off on a tangent on this, but it's relative. If you go out and take down a deal, and I, I kind of did a, a quick little thing here, a very simple value add, one you see all the time. You know, I, I ran this here and you're increasing rents from $1,000 to 1100 bucks. It's 10% increase. Very reasonable. You see that all day long. You're going to add $50 a month in rubs to this thing because the existing owner is not currently charging for utilities. And then it's a mom and pop owner. So you're going to take their expense ratio from 50% to 40%. All that is incredibly reasonable. If you do that, with a 70% loan up front and you're putting up the equity, just by enacting that simple business plan, that loan's going to have an LTV of 54% at the end of your business plan, which probably is only going to take 12 to 18 months. Now you're under lever. You're going to want to refinance that anyway. So if you're going to want to refinance a 55% agency or bank debt within 18 months, do you really care that the interest rate's slightly higher for that short 18 months? in exchange for the non-recourse, in exchange for the flexibility, the quicker close, the less equity you have to raise up front, the less you have to give away of the back end of it because you're raising less dollars just for 18 months of utilization. It, it just, you know, to me, I'd rather have the flexibility if I believe in my business plan. Bring somebody in and can close the loan in 30 days or less, allow me to raise less equity. Or if I'm raising all that equity anyway, I just have a, a, a great fundraising team in place allows me to do more deals with the, with that equity. I'd spread it over more opportunities because instead of putting 35% in as equity, I'm only putting 15% in. Now I can double the number of deals I'm doing with the same equity sponsors. So, you know, there's a lot of components to it. And, and people sometimes just only look at that interest rate without realizing, hey, what happens if I do hit my business plan? You know, what am I going to do with a 54% LTV loan for the next 28 years of this 30 year loan I just took out? It, it, you know, you're going to want to refinance anyway. So, yeah, th th that's how I look at it. So, if I were to play devil's advocate, George, I'd say, you know, I'm looking at this market. I don't know what the Fed's going to do. No one never knows what the Fed is going to do. Uh, but we're at lowest interest rates we've ever seen. I'm, I feel like maybe I should lock in interest rates now while I can't, even if I end up being under levered, what's the response? No, and that's, that's a perfectly reasonable response. And, th and there are people that are risk adverse that will do that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's just a, that's a mentality yeah. is to go out and do that. Um, one, you'd have to find a fixed rate lender who's willing to fix it long enough where that matters really i mean fixing it for two years doesn't do you any good you're going to want someone who's going to fix it for 10 20 30 years so you're going to have to qualify for that one so you're probably going to have to bring in another sponsor who's maybe done enough business that would qualify for something like that 
Now that may be a, a recourse loan. So you're going to have to make sure you, you're willing to do that. And again, it, to me, it's like, one, I don't see interest rates jacking up in the near term. I mean, even the Fed saying, yeah, maybe late next year, but they're kind of getting a little squirrely about that. So maybe it's like middle of next year, but interest rates aren't going from a, you know, a live or virtually zero up to I four of two. <laughs> it's not going that way. Prime's not going from three and a quarter to five, you know, overnight. This is going to be a period of time. And again, we're talking bridge. We're talking 12, 24, 36 month business plans where you can still take people out. If you start going into a, a hyper increase in terms of interest rates, maybe it is a different story. Maybe people do lock in okay. rather than take that risk. But again, you're, you're going to be locking in at a very low leverage point. And when interest rates start going up, it's because of inflation. If inflation keeps going up more times than not, that means your rents are going up. If rents are going up, that's just further and further and further under levering this property and tying more and more equity into it. And what are you going to do? You're finally going to have such a valuable property to sell it. If interest rates are that high, what are you going to tell your investors? You're not reinvesting the capital. You're not going to buy another deal because cap rates are going to move with it, with interest rates at some point in time. Yeah, yeah, definitely some some pros and cons to weigh there. You mentioned LIBOR. Now, a lot of multifamily syndicators are familiar and, and watch the ten year very closely because that's what a lot of your agencies underwrite their yields right. to. Um, you know, now, what is LIBOR for? Going, so, well, I mean, that, that, that did year over year go up almost hundred basis points. It's since compressed down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But if you could just explain for our audience that maybe doesn't know what is LIBOR and then what are generally the spreads that you would see on top of the LIBOR rate? <laughs> so it's a pointless conversation now, but uh, LIBOR is actually going away soon. Yeah. Um, so far. Yeah. It's going away in about two it's years. So far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently it was a little too easy to be manipulated. Uh, LIBOR is just, it, it's similar to to what you'd see on a, on a treasury or prime. It's a little closer to prime because it's basically trading between banks, which is a little more from a Fed rate standpoint to LIBOR. It's a little more relevant than where uh, treasuries are. But it, it, it's just the, 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 the average bank rate that people are trading, it, it's currently been literally almost zero. I, I think it's like nine basis points right now for, for 30 year, I mean, for 30 day. So, you know, it's just another index. You can index over anything. So some, some lenders will do it over LIBOR, which I used to do. Um, now we do it over Prime just because our, our dollars, our interest rates are a little bit higher. So since we're kind of in that 6 7%, 8% range, depending on the deal, uh, we can use a three and a quarter index because we can spread over it. Uh, it it's, there's no rhyme or reason to it. It's just each industry, particular, whether it be banks, which do a lot over LIBOR, and now they're, they've got a switch and there's a lot of language. You'll see in new documents now saying, if and when a LIBOR goes away, we're going to switch to this or switch to this. There's SOFR, there's, there's Prime. There's a lot of other options. It's just an index. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're smart enough to know which index is the one that's going to trend higher on future rates, then maybe you should be up on Wall Street instead of buying an eight-unit duplex. <laughs> There's other ways to monetize that knowledge, certainly. <laughs> um, so, you know, generally, if we were to look at agency execution on a typical, you know, down the middle of the fairway value add deal, we're probably looking at sixty-five to seventy percent leverage. You know, maybe three to three and a half percent. We're recording this summer of twenty twenty-one, so you know this may not be relevant into the end of time. But um, generally, that three three and a half percent interest rate. Um, potentially non-recourse, depending on which age or which um, outfit you're going with. Bridge execution for something similar to that. Um, what, what are we going to see as far as terms, generally speaking, painting with a broad brush? You're going to be all over the spectrum. And that, that's why I love bridge. I, I've always been on the structure bridge side since the late 90s. When I started. Well, late 90s, I was doing affordable housing stuff. But early 2000s, when I switched over to, to the bridge side. And that's what I love about it. We don't have a box. I've had a lot of friends that worked in CMBS and worked for the agencies, worked for banks, and they, they, they stress over seven basis points of interest rate to win or lose the deal. It's a very tight box that they fit in. Bridge, as we discussed earlier, is a very broad term. And I've seen bridge lenders going all the way down to about 4%. And I've seen bridge lenders as high as 12 to 15%. 
it's all based on what the deal is they're looking at. That's what's great about bridge is any deal. And I, I tell people full lists all the time. I tell sponsors and brokers, you can send me literally anything and I can get you a quote on it. You may not like the quote. <laughs> I can get you a quote on literally anything you could possibly present to me because that's how bridge lending works. It all comes down to what's the commensurate risk versus the yield that I need to get there. So right now, today in multi, uh, you know, I see a lot of my competitors and ourselves kind of in that anywhere from four to 7% range. Uh, maybe it ticks a little up if it's a huge, you know, this fire damage units and it's in the tertiary market and it's a first or second time sponsor. Um, there's so many components because we don't redline it. I can do deals where somebody sold off the ground under it and it's a leasehold. I can do deals where someone's taking down a pace loan to do some renovations and upgrades on the property. I can do a deal with a foreign national or somebody who's who's new to the industry because we're underwriting the asset at the end of the day. We're underwriting where our exposure is and we're quoting accordingly. So you know, a lot of bridge is gonna be one to two points. It's typically 24 to 36 months because it's bridge. Uh, a lot of bridge is going to be non-recourse. Uh, usually, you know, you're always going to have your bad boy carve outs. You may have a debt service or carry reserve built into it somewhere, depending on the deal. But yeah, you know, that's where you're going to see. You're going to see it anywhere from 100 to 100 to 500, call it, uh, spread higher than where banks are. But you're also going to see leverage. I do multifamily deals up to 85% leverage. And as we discussed earlier, you have to start looking at what's the residual additional cost of my money versus a bank. And if it's lower than what you think your IRR is gonna be on the equity, it's already a good deal. And you're coupling that in with the additional structural benefits and the fact that myself and virtually every other bridge lender can close you in 30 days or less, as opposed to waiting around for 90 days plus for some of these agencies. So th there's, there's a time and place for any amount of money. I'm not saying bridge works for everybody, but bridge works for enough people because there's enough deals out there. So. Yeah. You know, just make sure you're not isolating out and saying you're only doing deals with agency because then you're looking at very specific assets and those assets are very sought after and they're going to become very competitive. And would you rather buy a scratch and dent asset at a six and a half cap, but you need to use six to 7% money to buy it and do your plan? Or would you rather go out and buy an asset at a, three to four cap because you can get 3% money. Is it really that much of a difference at the end of the day on the yield on your equity? It's, it's not, you're, you're gonna get driven down trying to compete with people for those agency qualifying assets. Yep, yep. The lower the risk profile, the more competition there's going to be ultimately. Correct. Correct. So um, you've been in real estate a long time, George. You said 20 plus years in the bridge lending space. You've seen a lot of really good operators and I'm sure you've seen some that weren't as good. Um, when you look, whether it's syndicators or not, what's the top reason or two that you see groups investing in multifamily real estate fail to perform? Fail to perform? It all comes down to, well, it doesn't all come down, but they say it all the time. It's, it's almost a cliche, but it's true. You, you, you make your profit on the acquisition. Um, number one reason I've seen people fail to perform is because they massively overpay because they have to buy something. You never have to buy anything. I don't care how much money you've got or how much equity you've raised or whatever. There are isolated, you know, 1031 exchanges and things like that. But don't put yourself in that position. <laughs> Honestly, when I was a broker, I was dealing with that where people were massively overpaying because they had a very short fuse for a 1031. But most people don't have to buy something. They're choosing to buy something but they feel like they have to. They go to a conference and everyone they met there and they're having a drink at the reception. Everyone else is buying property. So they have to run out and buy a property. They, they massively overpay. They end up buying something for 8 million bucks, but it only appraises for six. So they only get a loan for four. So now all of a sudden they got to put up too much equity on the back end of that thing. And you can run that all day long and you'll be lucky to break even at the back end of it. it it's that that's the single thing I've seen is people just massively overpaying. And I'll still quote the deal, but again, I'm quoting the deal based on a metric over appraised value and my internal value. And sometimes they've deviated tremendously over where they're under contract. Yeah. 
So we've got a lot of limited partners or uh, people who invest in syndications that listen to this show. You know, you've seen a lot of these offerings come across your desk. What's a red flag that tells you that somebody's overpaying for a deal? Well, I mean, if you're looking at a property, like I said earlier, if your business plan to make it work is substantial increases in rent, substantially lowering the expenses, but you're not putting any money into it, I can't see what the the transition is from, from its existing state to its perceived future state, other than the numbers being modified, then there's already an issue right there. Because if, if you're trying to run it up, if you're buying something on a cap rate today and you're assuming you're selling it five years later and you're assuming you're selling it at a lower cap rate five years from now to make your numbers work, it's a, it's a problem. If I look at the rest of the comps in the market and you're 20% over comps, and you say they're all comps, but half of them sold within the last 90 to 180 days. Like it, it just doesn't make sense. The, the, you know, if you're buying at a cap rate that's lower than where you can borrow money, big problem. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Like right now, cap rates are so so low. But the, but at the end of the day, cap rates are in part a product of spread over the, the cost of finance, and yeah. interest rates are very low. So if interest rates are dragging you down, then you you can afford to buy something at a four, four and a half cap rate if you're borrowing at a two and a half or three cap rate. It's, it's a similar historical trend, you know, spread of plus or minus 200 to 250 basis points as what you've seen previously. It's just, it's all dragged down together. But if you come in and tell me you're buying something at a two and a half cap and I know you're borrowing at four to six, like you're underwater day one. You got a long haul just to, just to catch up there's a problem there. Yeah. I tell folks, look at the comp sets um, and then look at what the exit cap rate. I think those are two really quick things that will tell you how aggressively the deal is being underwritten. Obviously there's a lot more to a story than just those two metrics, but those are the first two places that I look whenever an offering crosses my desk. And if you don't have some sort of cap rate expansion upon exit, uh, I'm going to have to dig a lot deeper before I get comfortable with that you deal. Always do. Look, look, I don't care if you think cap rates today are 5%, but you think cap rates in five years are four and a half based on whatever forward projections you're running. Don't do that. <laughs> like, un, un, you know, un, under promise and over perform. That, that's, that's the rule of, of any syndicator should have. Don't go out telling people that you're making 20% IRRs when interest rates are so they don't need a 20% IRR. Tell them you're making a 15% and surprise them with a 20 you know, go out and say, hey, cap rates stay are at, at 5%. So I'm increasing that 10 basis points or 25 basis points per year for every year I intend to hold this thing. And if God willing, five years from now, I sell it at a four and a half cap, it's a windfall. Like, you know, that, that's how you need to go out and do it. No one needs to to see a 20% IRR in a market where interest rates are three. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, go out and tell people 15, you're going to find your equity if you're a good, if you're a good operator. And you've got a track record, you're going to find the equity with that that 15% IRR package and then surprise them with a 20 and everyone will everyone will love you forever. Yep. Yep. Good advice. Um, as we wrap up here, George, uh, I'm curious, you know, real estate has been in turmoil, much like the rest of the world over the last 18, 24 months. I mean, the bridge space, highly volatile with COVID, um, but generally in real estate multifamily specifically in America, what do you see as maybe a, something that is a tailwind and a headwind over the next 18, 24 months? What are you watching? Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm personally not overly concerned. Like I do all asset classes. So, um, you know, I'm a little concerned about business centric hospitality because there is the opportunity now to, to do Zoom and, and do other options. Uh, a little concerned about office, but I do see a lot of people going back, especially in, I'm in Florida. So we've been open pretty much from day one around here. Um, I'm at a hotel for a conference right now. But, you know, from a, you know, from a multi standpoint, let's focus on, on the asset that we're really discussing here. With, with material costs going up, you're seeing, you know, the potential for a little less supply in the future. We ran into that in 2008. And when we ran into that, it was almost an unintended moratorium on development because nobody would lend on it. And that created a supply demand imbalance that goes today. I mean, my neighbor, where I live in Manatee County, Florida, down south of Tampa, we have a 
0.6 months supply of housing on the market. Yeah. I mean, that's insane. It's essentially zero houses on the market. Well, all these people selling the houses, where are they going? They're going to apartments. Apartment rents are going through the roof. I mean, apartment apartments work in all cycles. They may not work as well in some cycles, as other, but, but they always work. So I'm not concerned about multifamily. I'm really not concerned about any asset class. I think at the end of the day, what we saw in COVID is massively different than what we saw in 2008. In 2008, it was a fundamental break in the financial system that was brought on by real estate. That was a huge problem. I was in the market at that time. Uh, what we're seeing now is, I, I think, I hope, uh, I'm banking on a, a short-term blip. It's, it's a problem that was caused by an external factor that is going to resolve itself. And the nice thing this time around is people like myself, people like all the banks, were very conservative throughout this entire upcycle we didn't have 90 plus percent stretch seniors on construction on a regular basis. We didn't have no doc loans on single family homes. We didn't have, you know, the random, you know, banks showing up out of nowhere. Like I, I had a competitor back in 2006 and seven that was doing like 105% construction. Loans. They were doing virtually the entire cost plus baking and all the carry, all the interest, you name it. Wow. That bank, that bank no longer exists. Surprise. Yeah, but you don't see that now. So I don't think you're going to see that the defaults people are were expecting. I know a lot of people raise money for, um, you know, default debt funds, and, and they thought there was going to be, you know, the next 2000. I just don't see it. I, I think I think all the asset classes are going to come out fine. There's going to be blips in all of them. I think higher material costs are going to pull back some of the future supply stuff that's already been started is going to finish. So you're going to see more supply in the near term, but you know, unless lumber costs start coming down and labor st costs start coming down, you may not see as much supply on there. I think the housing market, especially in places like Florida, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, places like that, it is really going to spur a lot of people to head towards the multifamily, which I think is going to create even more demand and further increase rents. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us today, George. Uh, where can our audience reach out to you, find out more about what you do with Arena Lending? Sure. Uh, you can reach me uh, on my email. That's G Cruz. That's uh, G K R U S E at Arena Co. A R E N A C O dot com. Uh, you can also find me on LinkedIn. I've been on there since the beta test back in the day. Uh, so I'm always bouncing around LinkedIn. That's uh, just at George Cruz, KRUSC, or you can always call or text me on my cell, 941-321-6393. I'm down in Bradenton, Florida, just south of Tampa on the Gulf Coast of Florida, but uh, I travel nationwide and I do business nationwide, so feel free to reach out from wherever you are. Excellent. Well, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Daily Real Estate Syndication Show. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate, while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.